Now for calorimetry. Good time. So now we're going to be throwing a bunch of equations at you, so get ready to do some math. It's the science of measuring heat. And we measure heat with our thermometers, but you have to remember that now in this, these particular situations, we're involved in um, dissolution or dissociation. We're involving in reactions. So we have a system and a surroundings that we're dealing with here. And the thermometer is always taking the aspect from the surroundings here. So we have to watch our signs, our positive and negative signs, and where they're going to go. The energy required to raise the temperature of one gram, one degree Celsius, that's going to be the specific heat capacity. And that involves the gram measurement. We are going to be using molar heat capacity, though, too. And that is the energy required to raise one mole, one degree Celsius. And uh, they're going to be interchangeable because we can always change grams to moles and we can change moles to grams. So we're going to be doing a lot of that. And we got to think conceptually that we can do that so we can rotate that into the problem. The science of measuring heat. We want to talk about heat. Energy required to raise the temperature of one gram, one degree Celsius is what we call specific heat capacity. Now, this is going to be the most confusing part is the moles and the gram part is very interchangeable in these problems because it's really just a one-step conversion to convert between moles and grams here. You didn't see a lot of this last year because we didn't spend a whole lot on thermochemistry and calorimetry. But there are lots of math problems where you see you're going to be able to be given the molar heat capacity to figure out the specific heat capacity and then still be able to use Q equals MCAT. Okay? So molar heat capacity is the energy required to raise the temperature of one mole of the substance by one degree Celsius. And last year we used a lot of the molar, like heat of fusion, molar heat of vaporization for phase change. And then we used Q equals MCAT for the warming part, but we really didn't use like the molar heat capacity a lot when we were just doing the like warming on the heating curve. So now we're going to be able to use both. And that's what the problem set that's due Thursday is going to have a lot of. You're just going to have to realize off the bat that you're going to be doing some conversions a lot between the grams and the, and the moles. And figuring out where to start. You can find the, the heat with the one use it in another, these equations become very interchangeable. And this is where some of that conceptual flexibility, where you're going to take the concepts, be able to mesh them together so you can use them in various ways. Not just go out, oh, okay, this equation is only for this situation. No. Sometimes now you can apply it with this other equation. You can set them equal to each other. You can manipulate a lot of variables here. Two reactants are at the same temperature and mix. Resulting solution gets warmer. This means the reaction taking place is exothermic. Remember, the temperature would be measured by a thermometer, and the thermometer is always taking the position of the surroundings view. So an increase in temperature means heat's being released. Endothermic reaction pools the solution. Remember the, once again, the thermometers from the surroundings perspective. So if the energy is being taken from the surroundings and put into the system, that it's going to drop and look like it's cooling down, that heat transfer again. The coffee cup calorimeter. We're going to be doing this for the hand warmer lab. Our makeshift calorimeters where you put two coffee cups together. And we're going to be using actually the stirring hot plates, so we'll have the little magnetic stirrers in there. And we'll be constructing it when we're uh, doing our heat of solution. So this is kind of what the interest of what we'll be doing here. And we'll have some, you know, uh, styrofoam tops as well. It's not perfect, but it's a better insulator than just say using glass. Now for the calorimetry. Using mass, the Q equals MCAT. You've heard of this. We've done this before. Q is always the energy released. Negative Q or energy absorbed is going to be positive Q. And it's measured in joules. M is always the mass. C here is going to be the specific heat because it's joules per gram to degree Celsius. 
and then delta t is the temperature change, which is the final minus the initial. Right, sure, everybody remembers that, that this is Tf minus Ti. T final minus T initial. So that's the regular normal formula we did a lot with last year. Now for using one, same idea here, but we can do the same with the molar heat capacity equation, except for now it's an N instead of an M, same idea, N means moles, and then the C here is no longer the specific heat capacity, it's the molar heat capacity, so it will be in joules uh, per mole per degree Celsius. Everything else is pretty much the same, but the heat gain is going to equal the heat loss. So if you're given one side in moles and one side in grams, you can still work them together because the Q's or magnitude should still be the same. The Q's will be the same because the heat being lost by the system and gained by the surroundings is always going to be the same value. It's just going to be us opposite sign. Mm -hmm. That's why you can interchangeably use these against each other. Like, just show it, you don't have to write them all down, but this is just kind of an idea here of what you can see. Positive surroundings, like the heat's being gained by the surroundings means the system's losing, so that would be a negative Q from the system if the Q in the surroundings is positive. Vice versa is true, so if the surroundings is losing energy, that means the system's gaining, so it's negative Q surrounding equals positive Q for the system. So that means at any time you can derive any of these to the way that you need to. You know, the Q equals MCAT and Q equals NCAT, you can use them against each other. And this, this side could be the surroundings for one, and this one could be the system for one, or it could be switched. You gotta watch your negative positive signs very carefully too in these problems. You could also do the molar against the molar, just watching your sign as to what's gaining and what's losing. Or you can even set the, the mass one to the molar one, or the, um, and once again, the, the, this one could be the one losing right here because of the negative, this one could be the one gaining. But they're very interchangeable and you can use them in your problem set like such. But do watch your positive negative signs because you guys pay attention to who's gaining and who's, leaning, who's losing. Now we're going to try a couple of examples where we kind of look at conceptually thinking and then we actually just go ahead and calculate it out using regular MCAT. Then we'll get into some more detailed problems. So if we're looking at this one, I mean, do we even really need to calculate this one? 100 grand sales. 100 gram sample of water at 90 degrees is added to a 100 gram sample of water at 10 degrees. Can you come up with an idea possibly of where the final temperature of the water would be? So both water, they both have 100 grams, so if we're doing Q equals MCAT, we have positive MCAT equals negative MCAT. That's what's going to be the same. Two of the variables, right? The specific heat of water is still 4.184. The masses are the same. So the, really the only difference that's going to be is the temperatures, right? One starting out at 90, the other one starting out at 10. So uh, which one's gaining, which one's losing? So the 90 is going to have to belong on this side where you would do TF minus 90. This side would be TF uh, minus 10. Right? So you could, you know, calculate it out, but should kind of see that it's going to fall right where in the middle, right? It's going to be 50. Because it's the same mass, it's the same specific heat, and you're just really like cutting the difference between the two. So 
90 minus 10 would be 80, divide that by 2, it's 40, so 90 minus the 40, or, uh, you know, 10 plus the 40. And that's how I would go about thinking about that one. Because they're equal masses, that one gives you an indication where you don't really have to do a whole lot of calculating. But if you look at the next one, you can probably guess where the temperature range is going to be, but it does actually ask you to calculate it as well. So go ahead and try and do that. Because if I'm adding the warmer and the colder together, who's going to lose heat? The warmer is going to lose heat. The one that's cooler is going to gain heat, meet in the middle. Yeah. So that's a good question. And that's how I think of thinking about here, like 100 gram sample of water at 90 is added to a 500 gram sample at 10. The 90 is still going to lose. The 10 is going to gain. But look at the masses now. You have much more of the what? Of the cooler one than you do of the warmer one. So where do you think it should fall? You know, before you even calculate, where do you think it's going to fall? The more massive amount is the cooler side. Should be somewhere in here for C, right? Now go ahead and calculate. You can you can plug and chug. Okay, so hopefully you did set this one up where you did some variation on the grams, but make sure you put in for this side. You could, you know, do the 100 and distribute it. Some people were making it a one, um, but the TF minus 90. This whole side has to be the negative side because it's losing. This side over here would be the one that's gaining, so it gets the positive side. Um, and I noticed like some people made this a one and this a five. This part of just a one and this is a five, that works. Like I said, it's not gonna work if you're taking a piece of hot iron and sticking it in the water. Now you have to concern yourself with a different specific heat because the iron will have its own specific heat. But, um, and then, you know, the C's cancel out, so I didn't even write them in because they'll be the same on both sides. <laughs> But you should have got 23 degrees. And if you did the next one too, hopefully you already plugged and chugged. Oh, this one actually is one where you do have the iron ball being added. So you have a specific heat for the iron where you would have to set it up. And the iron specific heat, metal specific heats are a lot lower than water takes water a lot more energy to change its temperature. So keep that in mind. So C between 10 and 50 again. And I got 18, which is 17.8 rounded up. So sounds good. But this one, you definitely would have needed to write it all out. Uh, so the 50 grams of the water 4.184 for the water and then you have it is at 10 degrees this is the positive side it's going to gain and the iron had 50 grams its specific heat though is 0.45 small amount and then it would be TF minus 90 this side meets the negative out front don't forget that big negative sign out front when you're calculating so that you can solve for that final temperature. And then it becomes just a big algebra game and adding like terms and all that good stuff. Q solution calculations. QAQ. And that's what you're going to do in the hand warmer lab too. When you take like the salt, stick it in the water, you'll be measuring a temperature change. But there's a few little nuances to heat of solution. So, the mass is always going to be the total mass. Okay, this is like the total mass. So you need to add your water plus your salt grams together. When you're doing the heat of solution, 
Usually the uh, specific heat is always going to be, it'll tell you in the problem the specific heat of the solution is basically the specific heat of water. Oh. This is where it gets confusing though because the solution is the system. What we're measuring, the temperature change is the AQ that's surrounding. So when you get your AQ value, you have to change the sign to get Q solution. Because remember, the solution is the system. AQ and what we measure is from the surrounding perspective. You have to remember to change that sign. Then what they usually ask you to do further on to calculate delta H of solution, you take your Q solution, your heat value, and you divide it by your moles of your solute. So that is only the salt you would change to moles and put on the bottom there, not the water. It only cares about the salt. This one we're going to be using a lot in the hand warmer lab. This concept too changing the sign there. So what we're measuring is really from the surroundings perspective. So in order to find the heat of the solution, we would need to change the sign. The ones that heat up and give off heat, the temperature raises up. The Q solution should be negative, because it's the one that's exothermic. The ones that where the temperature decreases is going to be endothermic, so your Q solution should be positive. So that's why we have to change the sign there or it will, won't work right. So you're going to need to use this one in uh, the problem set. And do you remember that the mass is the total mass? You need to add both masses together in there, the water mass and the salt mass. That's the only other difference there. So let's take a look at this one. When 1.34 grams of potassium bromide dissolves in 74 grams of water, in the coffee cup calorimeter, it gives you the temperature change. Assume that all the heat was absorbed in the dissolving process comes from the water, and the specific heat of the solution is the same as that as water. Now, before I even begin, I can tell what kind of reaction this, or what kind of dissolving process this is, based off of the temperature. What's happening to the temperature? Decreasing. Decreasing, so I know it's got to be endothermic so it's taking stuff in from the surroundings making it colder like I said this is where that sign change is going to come in so I can tell that it's endo because I look at the temperature change and it decreases now calculate the solution for the uh, Q solution for this process well I'm going to do QAQ first I add up my mass Okay, and that ends up being, what, 75.34 grams. It tells me to assume it's the same as water, so 4.184. And my temperature change is going to be 17.279 minus that 18.000. And we're going to get QAQ here. What's that value going to be? And, you know, looking at the measured values here, we have three. This one has five. So I'm going to go with three. So I ended up with negative two, two, seven joules. That's QAQ. Still sticking with QAQ. Now, to make this Q solution, it's going to end up being a positive two, two, seven joules. See how we have to do that? Flip the sign. Now, for one mole of the KBR, I need to change my KBR grams to moles. So I'm going to do that. Taxing is 39.1, gramming 79.9. Am I right? Somebody verify that, please. Okay, so this is my moles. Now all I have to do is take my two two seven joules and divide it by my moles. You have to remind the situation. Yeah. 
Yes, this one's very important, being able to calculate. Now you can do this one of two ways. I'm going to do it at the end. This is going to give me 2, 1, or 2, oh, 2, oh, oh, joules per mole. But delta H isn't normally recorded in joules per mole. What is it normally recorded in? Kilojoules per mole. So really, just to make this kilojoules, you divide by a thousand. So you can you can change it at at the joule point. Like you could change this to kilojoules and go start there, or you can just do it at the end, like I'm doing changing it to kilojoules per mole by dividing by a thousand, you'll get your kilojoules per mole. But delta H is going to be re typically reported in kilojoules. You won't see it reported in joules. So here it has that extra added step at the bottom where you have to convert the grams of the salt to moles. You take your heat of solution, the Q solution, divide it by the moles of the solute and change that over to kilojoules and you will get your delta H solution. That's what the kind of the calculations you'll be doing in the hand warmer lab too. And we're good. All right, this one's a little different because now we're taking two solutions and combining them in a chemical reaction and going to be figuring out what's going on here. And we want to do it from the perspective of the silver nitrate. Calculate the delta H reaction of the silver nitrate. Okay. Assuming that the combined solution has a mass of 100 and a specific heat of the 4.184. We'll still use that number. So let's think about here. Uh, how would we want to begin? Any ideas? Well, it tells us, yes, milliliters. 50 of the 0.1, 50 of the 0.1 of the hydrochloric. Two 50 milliliter solutions being added together, and it tells us the combined solution has a mass of what? 100, and most, you know, water solutions are going to have the same density of water, which would be one gram per milliliter. So we could assume it's 100 grams there, right? Uh, what else do we know is provided to us? That temperature change. What can we find right off the bat? QAQ. So let's do that. Let's find QAQ. So 100 grams times R4.184 times our temperature change. What kind of process is this, by the way, just by looking at the temperature? Exothermic because the temperature went up, so heat was being released. So what do we get for QAQ? Is that what you got? <laughs> Measured values here. We'll just keep it. Everything in here was four, so I'll just keep it at four for now. This is joules. This is QAQ. To find Q solution, all I need to do is do what? Just make it negative. There you go. So now we have the joules for the solution. You could change this over to kilojoules right now if you want to for that end step. But we also need to find a what? Delta H, yes, but what do we need to find in order to find delta H? We have Q solution, what goes on the bottom is the moles. So what do I need to do here? Right, if I multiply that, do I get 0 0.005? <laughs> We could divide this then by the 0 0.00500 moles. Change this over to kilojoules by moving it over three spots to the left, and we can get our delta H 
We turned it off first, right? You could, yes. So we end up with at negative 60, oh, three digits, 67 point, is everything three digits? Yeah. 7.8 kilojoules per mole. All right, bomb colorimetry. Slight variation here, a little bit different, and uh, very much the same too. So little nuances here. A bomb calorimeter, you see, is this uh, device over here, this picture. Inside is a chamber. Here's the chamber. That's where the reaction is going to take place and it's surrounded by water and the water is going to absorb or release the heat in order to you know get the well actually since it's bomb cover you're usually going to have combustion reactions going on here so they're typically going to be exothermic combustions are exothermic in, by nature so uh, you're really going to be looking at the water of, uh, absorbing the heat from the reaction and uh, then you can get the enthalpy change. So this is an insulated container. It's very contained. So the heat exchange should be um, completely kept without anything being lost to the environment so you won't get experimental error. This is what we would love to have in the lab to be able to do these heat exchange experiments. Of course, they're expensive and not probably appropriate for like high school or even probably beginning college classes, something more like a uh, graduate level, PhD level, be using devices like this. And uh, there's a stir, there's a thermometer, there's a way to get the uh, reaction going. In this case, it looks like it's an electrical simulation with wires to get that initial spark going for the combustion reaction. Now there's a special equation. The actual bomb calorimeter has its own heat capacity. That's what we call C-Cal there. Q reaction is the heat evolved by the reaction. And delta T is still the change in temperature. Final minus initial. So the actual device itself has its own specific heat capacity. So the Q reaction, basically the heat, C-Cal, heat capacity, and the heat capacity uh, is usually going to be reported in like kilojoules per degree Celsius. That way, as you see, when it's multiplied by the temperature change, the degree Celsius will cancel and you end up with kilojoules, which is, you know, appropriate heat unit here. Here's an exercise. It's a lot of information in here, so we need to kind of decipher what's going on here. Combustion of the methyl hydrazine liquid rocket fuel produces this wonderful reaction. When four grams of the methyl hydrazine Busted in a bomb calorimeter, the temperature of the calorimeter increases from 25 to 39.5 degrees Celsius. The heat of combustion is 28.25 kilojoules per gram. Calculate the heat of reaction for the combustion of one mole. The previous equation gave us what, what were we supposed to be looking for here? What was our bomb calorimetry equation? Okay, and what did I tell you C cal should be reported in? Kilojoules per, per degree Celsius, right? We do have a temperature change, so we have that right here. We're going to need that. But do we have a C cal? No, I don't see anything up there that's kilojoules per degree Celsius. Can we figure out the seat cal though? What, do, what did they tell us? 
that heat of combustion in kilojoules per gram, correct? Now, so we can do some manipulations and some conversions and uh, derive our CCAL. If I have 28.25 kilojoules, that's about to put kilograms, let's put kilojoules though. Really? Okay, gotta put that down. There we go. Kilojoules per one gram, right? How many grams are we using? We're using four grams here, right? So we could put the four grams up here, right? And for CCAL, since once again we're looking for, for CCAL, we need a kilojoules per degree Celsius unit. We need one degree Celsius, though. We need to, to be out of one degree Celsius. How do we figure out that temperature? Four grams is making it go from 25 to 39.5. So we need to do our delta T first. Let's go ahead and calculate that. 39.50 minus our 25. That gives us 14.5. So this is 14.50 degrees Celsius. So if I put that down here, right, will my uh, units cancel? The grams will go goodbye. And will everything be out of per one degree Celsius? Yes. So this is how I can take the information given with the different units and I can derive what I need eventually for my bomb calorimeter equation. Cal then ends up being negative, well, no, seven point, we'll use the negative in a second, 7.793 kilojoules per one degree Celsius, right? So now we know our CCAL, and now we can plug and chug. So this is why some of these problems get a little complicated. Is they're, oh, you think this is a simple equation, but they didn't give it to you in the exact form that you wanted it. And now you have to figure out a little bit extra. So that brings it up more to the AP level. So you would put this in here, but it's negative. Remember, negative CCAL. Once again, they do that sign there to make sure that you're getting the correct sign on the delta H. And so this is going to be kilojoules per degree Celsius, and then we're multiplying it by our temperature change, which happened to be 14.0 degrees Celsius. And we end up with what's our key reaction? with 4, so 113.0. Now we need to calculate the heat of the combustion per one mole. So what do we need to do now? This is our kilojoules. Change the grams to moles. We have our 4.00 grams. Oh, oh, oh grams. What's our molar mass of our methyl hydrazine? One carbon, six hydrogens, two nitrogens. Do you get 46.09? Check me, make sure. And we get moles, right? So if we did our 113 divided by that, negative 113 divided by the mole, this is your kilojoules, right? And this would be kilojoules per mole. Lots of steps there. Can be very confusing. 
That's why you got to pay attention to the different steps. Pay attention to what they give you. Now, some of the problems, they'll just give you the CCAL, and you don't have to do that extra step in the beginning. Reviewing some phase diagrams and heating curves, right? We're on to that now. Everybody remember this lovely diagram from last year? Yes. And what does it tell you? What information does it provide for us? What state a certain substance is in at different temperatures and pressures? Yes, the state the substances are at different temperatures and pressures because at different temperatures and pressures uh, you have the different states here. There's a couple other notable things on the graph here. At one atmosphere, you go over here to the line. What is that called? They may know. What is this line, first of all? This line right here represents what? Melting. This is melting. This way is freezing. Because we're going between the, the um, solid mm -hmm. to the liquid, right? There's a grammatical error. There is? The large drawing is not too scary. Oh, there is a grammatical error from the book. You're right. I should write the publisher. Yes. Uh, so what is that one atmosphere, me going over there, at the, over to the line, what is that telling us? We're, um, it is the phase change, but it is what we consider what? The normal. The normal melting point. So this right here would be the normal melting point. We always say the melting point of water is freezing point of water zero, but that's because we're referencing it from one atmosphere at standard pressure. Okay? So over here, too, what does this one represent then? Normal. Normal what? The yeah. normal boiling point. Yeah. Once again, we're referencing that from the fact that it's at one atmosphere. And so you know this line then, this line is going to be vaporization. This line is going to be condensation. And this line down here, does everybody remember that way? Sublimation. Sublimation. You get to see this one kind of soon because Halloween people like to have the what out? The dry ice. The dry ice and carbon dioxide, dry ice, uh, it sublimes, that's what we get the smoky appeal from. And the other way is called deposition, yes. <laughs> then the other significant part is that one right there, what's that called? Triple point. The triple point, and that means what? All three states mm -hmm. exist simultaneously. Correct, it's all in equilibrium, they're all existing. Um, you can like Google the triple point of different substances. Some people have actually videoed them where they have it in a closed flask where they have a vacuum so they can suck the pressure out to get to the right one. But you can check out uh, some uh, triple points if you want to. I'll put a link up if you want to look at a video how it goes from solid to liquid to gas and kind of just keeps changing at that triple point. It's very cool. How about this one up here? I can't see it very well because I wrote over it. It's called the critical point. Does anybody know what that means? I'm going to guess by the fact that the line ends. The that line ends, ends, yes. Water vapor. So up here, you get to a point because the line ends where we're not really a liquid, we're not really a gas anymore. They're called super critical fluids. I believe that's the correct term. The pressure is so high, it's pushing the molecules together. But the temperature is also so high, so the particles want to move around very fast and spread out. So it's kind of in an in-between phase. So that's what that critical point is. And there, there is, you know, we're never going to see that. We're never going to be at that pressure or at that temperature. But uh, just so you, you know, that's another signifying thing on our diagram here. The y-axis is always the pressure, the x is the temperature. You can see it in Kelvin or Celsius. And all this information is what it's providing. So hopefully this is just a big review of last year. 
Now looking at specifically the water diagram. What is special about our water diagram? Why does it have negative sloping solid liquid line? There's the specialness right there. That have to do with, that, that do with what? It's well, it does kind of have to do with one of the unique properties of water. What is one of those unique ones? Has to do with phases. Uh, it's Ice is less dense than liquid water. So that negative sloping line there, most of our phase diagrams for other substances, and you'll see one in just a second, it kind of goes like this. So still a positive slope here. Water's the only one really that has a negative slope between the solid and liquid line. And that really has to do with the pressure. Because the density of the solid is less, you apply more pressure. Um, the liquid phase can endure that pressure better. So that's why we get that negative. So because when it goes to, from the solid to the liquid, it becomes more compact. So it has a better ability to deal with the pressure. So that's why that line is negative and reversed. So this is our phase diagram of CO2. And I put this on here for you. But what's special about it? Can you see any notable? Look at, the, look at the, where the pressure is. Look at where the temperature is. Try to analyze, see what, what could be, what could we consider special about CO2? Also try to think about our reference point of CO2. Yeah, where are we going to be most of the time here? Oh, really? We're over here, in what, middle, room temperature for Celsius is what, 25 degrees-ish, 30 degrees-ish? So right here, we're about at one atmosphere. If you were up at the mountains, it'd be a little bit less, but... Um, so we're kind of right here. In the normal atmosphere, it's not going to be liquid. In normal atmosphere, we're never going to see the liquid phase. Right? Liquid phase is at a pressure that is 5.1. 5. 5. The only phases we're going to be able to see is the solid, because we can cool down the temperature, and, I'm sorry, the gas. Those are the only two phases we're going to be able to see in our atmosphere. Because I'm not going to go withstand, you know, five ATMs of pressure to try and <laughs> see liquid uh, carbon dioxide or anything. Just say. So really, in our re reference point, we only see the two phases. We don't get to see the third phase. So it's kind of unique in that respect. The triple point is way above our reference point here for the pressure. I mean, we can still manipulate the temperature there, but like I said, for us, really high pressures, I'm not subjecting myself to that, no thank you. Uh, so we're really only going to see the two phases, and you'll see, like I said, you'll see them at Halloween, because people put out the dry ice and you get the nice smoky sublimation going on, it gives you that nice eerie fun feeling, right? So that's pretty cool about the CO2. And if a sample of a solid is heated at 1 atm, what will eventually happen? I think we've kind of already covered that. It's going to gas and I go undergo sublimation. So that's what we're going to see. When you heat a sample of substance at 1 atm, how do you know if it will melt, vaporize, or just sublime? In other words, how will you know whether or not it's going to do the two phases or three phases? What can you look at? The position of the triple point will tell you how many phases you're going to see. If the triple point is in, your, in our range of reference, we'll see all three. But if the triple point, like here, where the pressure is at the triple point would be way higher than our normal range, uh, we will only see the two phases. Heating curve. Let's label this heating curve. What's A to B? Solid doing what, though? 
It's being solid. No, it's not just being solid. What is it doing? Heating up. It's warming. That solid is warming. So what's happening to its kinetic energy? Kinetic energy is increasing. So the solid is still, you know, in its they're in their fixed, you know, closed positions, but they're vibrating faster and faster and faster until they eventually get enough energy to break those intermolecular forces that are holding the particles together and they can start spreading out and actually get to that phase change. The first phase change starts here, right? The first plateau. So this is a heating curve. We're going to go and heat things up, although you might see one where it's a cooling curve going the opposite direction, and everything would be opposite. So uh, B to C is going to be what? Melting, because we're going to be going from the solid to the liquid. And we're breaking some of those intermolecular forces holding the substance together so that they spread out and make the liquid. Now, from C to D, what's going on here? The liquid is warming, right? Once again, the kinetic energy is increasing. And, uh, you know, I've used this analogy before with my regulars that when I want to cook some pasta, I have to put the water in a pot, I have to put the pot on the stove, and I have to turn it on and leave it on for about 10 minutes, right? What has to happen? The water has to warm. So that's, you know, watching water boil is not fun. It's like watching paint dry. Seems like it takes forever. But that is, this is the phase where you're, or this is the time frame when you're waiting for that water to finally start bubbling. Once it starts bubbling, you're here. You're at that point. Because now it's undergoing vaporization. And that, that's because we're going to go this way, because we're heating it up, right? We're vaporizing. Now I can throw my pasta in and start cooking it. So if I were to just leave it, eventually all the water would be gone. But most of us, you know, only get it to the boiling point so that we can start cooking. And then our last one here, E to F, is going to be the gas warming. Now remember, the cooling curve, which would be opposite, you would start with your gas slope, then you would do condensation, then you'd have your liquid slope in the middle, and then you would do freezing, and then the last slope. So it would go more like this. Yeah, just the opposite direction, but it would be cooling it down rather than heating it up. So that would be what the cooling curve would look like. So increasing kinetic energy here. You are changing your potential energy at the slopes because the repositioning the molecules, breaking those forces. How can you find the freezing or melting point on a heating curve? You need to look for the plateaus. This one's not labeled, but most of them would be labeled with the actual temperatures on the side there. So if you look for the first plateau, you'll know that it's the melting freezing one. If you look for the second plateau, you know that that's going to be your vaporization. Right? Makes sense? What can be determined about the lengths of the plateaus? What's significant about those lengths? Why is this one shorter than this one? Because that one, the first one takes less energy. Yes, it does take less energy. Melting does not take as much energy because you're not breaking all of the intermolecular forces. When you vaporize into a gas, all of those forces are supposed to be broken because we're making the assumption that the gas particles have no attractive forces. Because they're randomly bouncing off the walls of their container. So the vaporization plateau is longer because the heat amount needed to completely break those forces is much greater. And it asks for the equations to calculate the energy of the phase change. So well, does anybody remember last year what we did when we had a phase change one? What was that equation? No, nobody remembers the phase change equation. 
on here, what we would do at this point, you would probably be given grams and you change it to moles. Moles times the heat of fusion. That delta H fusion, you remember that? That would give you your heat, your Q here for the phase change. And heat of fusion is the value for the melting or freezing. So when you're adding energy in, it's a positive delta H to phase change. If you were freezing it though, it would be a negative delta H fusion, just the opposite sign, because that would be exothermic. So here, we would do Q equals the moles times the what? Delta H what? Vaporization. So the heat of vaporization there, once again, you're heating it up to break the forces. So this way, you know that these processes are endothermic in nature. But if we wanted to condense it, it would just be a negative sign on that delta H of vaporization because heat's going to be released during the condensation. And that the, going the opposite direction, the cooling down process, remember that is exothermic. So the signs are just different. They're the opposite. Yes. Yes, okay, so here we have our solid particles that are in their fixed positions, correct? And in order to get them to spread out to become the liquid, you have to break some of those forces. So that's what the heat's going in to do, is to break those forces, right? When you're melting, you only have to break some of them, because there are forces, intermolecular forces, between the liquid particles still holding it together, that's why it can take the shape of the container, you know, and it still, you know, looks like something of a substance. But in order to get it to change from a liquid to a gas, you have to break all of the intermolecular forces. Because the gas particles, we make the assumption, although sometimes they do under certain conditions, have attractive forces. But gas particles are randomly bouncing. They're in constant random motion, so they're not supposed to have any attractive force holding them together. So in order to break all of those, it's going to take a lot more energy. So that length of the plateau represents that larger amount of energy change needed to break them. All right, now for the slopes, right? How does we calculate the slopes? What do you use to do the solid warming? What equations do we use for that? How do we show that we're heating something up, say, per gram degree Celsius, warming it up? Q equals MCAT, thank you. So these are all, the slopes are all Q equal MCAT processes. So each slope, you would use Q equals MCAT to form it. Now the problem is with these problems, they usually want you to um, say they're going to say how much heat is needed to uh, vaporize a piece of ice at negative five degrees Celsius. So if you're doing a problem like that, you have to heat it up to the phase change. Then you have to phase change it. Then you have to heat it up to the other phase change. Then you have to phase change it. And then you have to, you know, heat it up to the final temperature, add all those heats together, it becomes a very long problem. We're going to do one like that in just a minute. But before we do that one, exercise 11, sketch a heating curve for a substance whose triple point is above one atmosphere. So over there to the right, how would we draw that phase diagram for the one that's above one atmosphere that we can't see all the phases. What, what would the heating curve for like carbon dioxide look like? How would it look? How many plateaus would you need? Only one, right? We only see the one phase change. And that phase change is, for carbon dioxide is the sublimation deposition phase change. So you only need one. If we were looking at carbon dioxide, something above one atmosphere, your heating curve would just be the solid slope 
the phase change and the yeah, so that would be that would be how like carbon dioxide would look, right? Because you would just have sublimation going on. If we were heating it up, if we were cooling it down, the only thing we would see, you know, would be the deposition phase change there going the opposite direction. I had it already here. This sublimation gas. Nice picture. So now we're taking, I didn't actually make you start it at like ice, so this one won't take as long, but we're starting 55 grams of liquid water at 22 degrees Celsius. Okay, 22, and we need to heat it to 106. How many phase changes are we going to undergo? Just the one. Good, because we have to go from liquid to gas. But before I can get it to uh, boil, I have to heat it up to what temperature? I have to heat it up to 100. So my first step here is to do a what? Q equals MCAT. So first step, I'm going to do Q equals MCAT because I have to warm the liquid water to 100 degrees Celsius. Because i got to do that first before it's going to phase change. Simple Q equals MCAT. But the only other thing that's kind of a little tricky here is you got to pay attention to your specific heats because the specific heat of water is not the specific heat of ice and it's not the specific heat of steam. Each phase has its own specific heat. Should be given to you in the problem. Like here, the specific heat of steam, it tells you. Also tells you the delta H of the vaporization there. So those, those information should, should be provided to you or they should reference a table that you're supposed to look up for that, those uh, data points. So here, but we are dealing with liquid water, so this one's 4.184. Our temperature change is going to be, final temperature is 100 minus the 22. So this is just going to give us our Q in joules. Don't forget, this is going to be in joules. So you, you gave us our specific heat, right? Well, the specific heat of water, you're supposed to know that one, 4.184. Oh, yeah. But other ones that are a little bit not well known, those would be provided in a table for you or in the problem like it is up here. So we get what over here. And since everything's three, I'm just going to keep it as three. Okay, so that's our first one there. Now we're at 100 degrees. So what do we need to do? Second step is we're going to uh, vaporize the water. So I need to do the mole times the delta H vaporization to get that Q. But do remember here that delta H's are always reported in kilojoules per mole. So this value that we're going to get is going to be in kilojoules. So we're going to have to do a little conversion at the end. We just do the conversion now. Or we could do the conversion now. That's fine. So, but I have grams here, so I need to do what to that? Change that to moles, right? It's water, so it's 18.02. Now, um, we could do the uh, one mole for the 40.2. 65 kilojoules, and as suggested, we could continue on and change that kilojoule to joules. So one kilojoule equals how many joules? A thousand. And then this Q answer will end up being in joules for us. So we can add it all together at the end. Big number though. That's what you got. Yes, check my numbers. Like I said I'm about to lose in my mind, so 
make sure we got the, got the right calculation there. So here is our second part. Still not done though, because now we've only vaporized it at 100 degrees. What do we still have to do? We have to heat it up to six more degrees. That's fine, right? All right, so some of the problems that make you start at like negative five degrees for the ice and you have to vaporize it at like 120. So that one takes five steps. But I, I decided that would be too long, so we're just going to stick with here. Now we have to warm it, warm the gas to. So we don't use like stuff from the previous step to do step three. Step one, step two, and step three. No, well, we will use this at the end because we want the total heat it took to do this process, yes. We want the entire heat required. So, yes, we will eventually have to add them up. But if we're warming the gas, what equation is that one? M cat, so that's a Q equals M cat. So, 55. Now, this is now the specific heat of what? Steam. So that's where we need this number, this 2.03. And our temperature change is what? Still 70, no, 6 degrees, because 106 minus 100. New temperature change, 106 minus 100 there. And this gives us. I'm getting 670 joules. Check my deal there. Let's add them up. So we end up with 142.570. Yeah, I guess I suppose if we change them all to kilojoules, this would be 123, right? No, this would be 124. This would be 17.9, and this would be 0.67. So we would really be going with that, right? 142.5. And then we would go with the this place value anyways. So 143,000 kilos, I mean joules, or 143 Either or. There is one like this in the problem set. I don't think it takes five steps, so I think it's a three-stepper, like this one. That's funny, though, if they hadn't 